very welcome with this uh, with us in this uh, platform that we're gonna present three to you. So I want to start with. Um, let me just get the right slide up again because oh, I mean the right one open. I've got to open now here. So let me just start from the beginning. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all the slides because you have received this as part of your uh, resource material when you um, went on what Tony sent to you. So this is just background on the three and then also the three modules. So ideally the three module is two hours. There is seven modules. So at UNISA they uh, prefer that we do one, two and three. Um, there is a new updated model now on public health research ethics that's 3.5 which is also a very good one if you're interested in research um, uh, health ethics then this one you can also do as soon as you've done one and two you have to do one to do two and then you have to do three but after that i think that when you go to the 3.1 3.5 you can decide which ones you are going to do this is level two training, which is then at UNISA regarded as um, formal training. That is also that the certificate that you receive is um, internationally recognized. So it is also a required training for ERC members, REC members. So I'm just gonna skip this. Um, I just wanna quickly show you. So, for those that still have to register, you have to go to your your browser and click in HTTPE that elearning 3org So the moment you are in the website, in the three website, you have to register at the bottom of the page. When you register, they are going to send you a, a code, um, a registration um, email to indicate that you have registered and then but this is the, normally the problem with this registration the email always go to your spam so when you are at your NISA you have a NISA account it will go to your spam account so you do have to create a new account it's your first time here you put in your username you choose a password just write it down but normally three are very friendly so I always forget mine so I'm in trouble if um, if I can't get in because it remembers your password. So create the account if you're new here. You can do it a few times. Uh, so it's not a lot of things. You just choose your username, you create a password, put in your email, put it in again, put in your first time, your surname, your city and your country and create a new account. Um, a tip, if you have a Gmail account, already use that. If it's problematic to access your email at this moment in time and you really want to do this training while we are live, you are welcome to use your account that's opened now, but just to check the spam for the registration um, uh, uh, email. When you, when, you, when you don't receive a registration email, you can't access three. So it's one of those that's linked and then you go to three and so on. So it will, it will send you a confirmation email like on the screen before you and then you can just click on on the confirmation and you'll be able to access this. So what I suggest for those that have not yet registered, it, um, try this while I'm presenting the overview of module uh, one, not to delay the other ones that have now registered already before the time. It is a process. It took me three times to register. Even with my Gmail, just just be be, uh, be um, vigilant of this. I also realized that only the next day when I came to the training that I had to register with my Gmail account. So try the Gmail account or other account other than the Unisa account. That is what I suggest. Then we will go to module one, but after my initial training, and then I will, I will uh, explain this to you later. So I'm going to go back now and start with my training. So the handouts are basically a slideshow that I just showed you explaining how to register and give you background on three. The other part of the handout was the, the resource material. It's exactly what you are going 
um, page by page through now now on the on the research uh, on the tree but it's just a easy it's a manual that you can print out and use so this is So the, a brief overview of the module. So we log into the tree module and complete a module. This is what we are doing today. I'm going to do it live with you. The model consists of four parts and 15 questions in total. Because this is a, a, a international um, a, a certification program course, you have to obtain, uh, you have to have questions. And uh, I mean, you have to have a formal assessment. So after the questions, you have to have 70% mark with the first try to obtain the certificate. Now, if you, I will explain it now, now again, but just remember, try to remember it. When we go through the questions and you have it wrong, uh, which is very easy because it's, some of them are quite tricky and um, this work is a little bit overwhelming when we start off. So in a big group, um, I attended three training in February, we were 42 in total. It's a quite a, good, a, a huge group, but I also felt that I lagged behind the whole time. Um, the presenter was talking, but I was reading. Um, so if you didn't engage in the reading, um, just listen and I will try to go through it again. If you don't obtain 70% at the end of the course, do not fear. If you have time today, start with it immediately again because it's still fresh in your memory and just do it again. It will allow you. Don't worry to um, don't worry that it will only give you two hours um, time. It will give you plenty of time. I've tested module 2.1. I left it on and I did an hour later. I continued with the module. It was still available and the questions. If it kicks you out, you just start again. It does remember what you have done. So um, if you have done a module one, for example, it will allow you to go to module 2.1. Your certificate will be available on the system it's it's actually a very friendly system except for the confirmation email part so the, the four parts that we are going to deal today with is first the historical overview why research ethics um, is important this is the normal research ethics um, clause the the first introduction to research ethics always starts with the historical overview why it is important um, they will be able to identify values and concepts of ethics related to conduct of research involving humans. That's the main um, focus of why research ethics are important. Then part two will consist, is consisting of core values and concepts of ethics um, for research involving humans. They will share some core values and after this part you will be able to identify and consult the relevant normative documents that it is that is available internationally and nationally. Part three also then gives a little bit more in-depth overview of normative frameworks available, um, except for the historical historical ones that have developed. Developed there was there's also new ones increasingly more focused on the importance of ethical evaluation. And in part four is then a short, short overview on the research evaluation and the role of RICS. So if you move to part 2.1, uh, module 2.1 and module 3.1, I really, really want you to carry on. This one is the most unfriendly of the modules. What I mean with this, the focus is bioethical, biomedical, um, not any other things. So you feel yourself a little bit lost. They do have a lot of case studies on clinical trials research, but just bear with, uh, just bear with the module. I will re definitely um, uh, recommend that you do model 2.1, which is then uh, giving the, uh, the Emmanuel Ezekiel, the eight principles of research ethics, uh, why it is important, why do you look, what, what is important in a research proposal and what do they review. This is an important model, and then 3.1 is the, um, is the informed consent, which is also very important. But the historical overview why research ethics is important. So it, it's all about the evolution of research ethics. Research are important. Why is research important? Research is important because mostly um, in the biomedical field, it tackles health problems, it tackles um, the beginning and the start of new medicine 
um, there's years and years of health research that evolved with, with research that has been done. So unfortunately, this is not a very a pretty picture and I won't go into a lot of detail because if you are a scholar and you are progressing in your studies, you would have uh, come across all of this information already. So the Nuremberg trials of the World War I and II really opened up the, a big debate on research ethics. It, it was then, the Nuremberg Code was then formed and then after that there was um, a very important declaration of Helsinki in 1964. So this, this declaration then is, is one of the most important documents that have seen a few um, revisions already, which of the latest one was in 2013. Unfortunately, there was questionable research practices that occurred in everywhere in the world, even after World War One and Two, and some of them were across North America and in Europe, where infectious agents were injected in orphans and mentally disabled persons and prisoners without their consent. So. Before all of this, the Nuremberg trials team gave a code of conduct to understand that it is inhumane to use uh, research participants without their permission to do studies on them. So shortly after the Nuremberg code, the World Medical Association published the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964. So after the there was quite more research practices even late in the 20th century. So two of these ones that standing out quite um, severely is the Willowbrook and the Skiji syphilis study in the 1960s. Well, the Willowbrook was actually not a syphilis study. It was, um, the Willowbrook was something different, but it was, um, it was not the syphilis study, but it was hepatitis virus that were, um, um, that were done on mentally retarded children to understand the natural history of the disease and to test the effect of gamma globulin. But the Tuskegee syphilis study is, is, is one that I'm going to stand still a little bit about. Um, it will be good if you can read the study. The study is a very good example of why it was necessary to, um, to have the codes that came into being after this. So in the syphilis study, it was in the South of America that this study was done. And it, it was a very poor part of, of, of America. And there was in, even the, the normal health um, uh, practices were not afforded to, to these participants. It was black men, which were more, mostly used in the studies. And this is a very devastating disease. So it has different stages in the human body. But when it started in 1932, the, these stages, that it, what it does in your body and the organ failure and the lesions and so on, and the sores and the different stages were, was very well known to science. So I'm talking about using participants, vulnerable participants, uh, today we record people in ill resource communities as vulnerable. So this, this now means they use vulnerable participants knowing very well what uh, the, this disease will do. 32 years later, they started in 1932, but 32 years later only, the declaration of Helsinki came into being. This is 32 years. And then even then, it, it continued for another eight years. So due to the atrocities and the questionable research practices, it gave way to the Belmont Report. So this is then the emergence of a formal requirements for ethics evaluation and continu continued vigilance, as you see on your screen. So it gave way to, to the Belmont Report in 1979 and then also very important to understand here, research involving human participants require review and approval by an independent research ethics committee. All of these uh, formal requirements that came into being, the International Committee of Harmonization 
basically American based, but due to the atrocities that happened there, um, due to the atrocities happening there, they, it gave way to um, the clinical, uh, the good clinical practice guidelines that we are still using today. It started off in 1990 and we saw a revised version in 2015. Um, I'm coming back to, to some of these guidelines. So part two of the module then is about core values and concepts of ethics for a research involving humans. So core values and concepts. Core values are truth, uh, dignity, um, values like that, and then they often are expressed as principles, especially in the research ethics domain. So one very important document that is even seen, it has it received a little less um, maybe coverage in documents worldwide. You will always see when you read research proposals that will refer to the Balmont Report or the Declaration of Helsinki. But the UNESCO Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 is a very important document. And if anything, I would really like you to go and read this document to see some of the values inflicted as principles in this document. It's a very important document. So the principle of ethics that a model, uh, model one is, is lifting out here are very important principles. Uh, we will give some more attention to them when we go into the, um, the real training on the internet. But it is, um, I can just, you can read it. Um, you have to justify the inclusion of humans in research. You have to ensure science value and validity. You must bring about more good and harm. You have to promote the interest of humans before science or society. And uh, there's also then the risk and benefits of research that's very important. You have to show ongoing respect and uphold transparency. We'll go in a little bit more detail when we move into the core. Then part three of the module gives an overview of normative frameworks applicable to health. So we have already discussed um, the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki, the seventh revision, uh, we have seen the seventh re revision in 2013. We also have the World Health Organization who has done very um, good work during the years to see that some of the, um, they see to it that some of the, um, like the millennium, the millennium Goals that was instituted in 2000, we had a review of them, they were 13, 15 year period, there was a review on them now in 2015. They look at, um, at, at, at sustainable environments, at health practices. So then there's also another council, also American based, um, a very good document as well, the SEALMS code. It's two or three pages, but um, it gives you a very clear understanding of how you have to perform research uh, using medical, in medical sciences. Then I've already talked on the um, ICH, CCP codes. The national instruments that we are using in South Africa is Department of Health Guidelines on Ethics Research 2015. The other day um, when we had training as well, um, it's very important and I cannot, I cannot stress this uh, too much. The Department of Health guidelines are some of the best I've seen. If there's anything that you want to read, just read them. If you are unsure, refer to them. Then we have the NHREC, which is the regulatory body in South Africa. They oversee the RECs. RECs are um, accredited, they receive accreditation and they do have audits um, as well. Then SAPRA, they are looking at clinical trials. Um, when you are in clinical trials, they have a register in a database and they do um, an overview of clinical trials. So just to inform you a little bit um, on the DOH guidelines, they are using the Balmont principles which is mainly the free respect for his, uh, uh, respect for persons, dignity and autonomy. Um, we will go into this in the course itself a little bit more, but important here to remember is that um, the ethical principles in the Balmont report, 
this basically free, but they have evolved now into four major um, principles, which the, are sometimes called the biomedical principles, but we do use them um, irrespective of what kind of research we are doing. And that are the, that they are the pillars of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So it's difficult words on the ear, but we will just go into it a little bit more uh, later. So just remember these four um, ethical principles are quite important. But four of the model then go into research ethics evaluation and the role of regs, a very short um, part of the module. Um, they will that they will let us understand what is ethical, what is research ethics, research ethics evaluation, what is important, and then the role and mandate of RICS. Okay, so module one, uh, we can go in on English. They have it in different um, uh, languages as well, but we will. I don't know any of those languages, so we will just stick to English. So we're going to introduction of research ethics. We have to continue. It seems that they will just give you, they will explain. I log in, hopefully um, it does remember me. Great, objectives. So they're giving the objectives of the end of module one, exactly what I have given already as an overview. So I don't, I'm not gonna delay on this point. Uh, it has four parts, they have 15 questions. You have to get 70%, all right. So, if you move down, you will see there's a button there, printable material. There you print out the resource material, which we have already done for you. And so I have sent it to you. So when you, on this, I just want to show you, uh, under model one, there's a little, you can see there's a, um, you can go into model one and there's a training certificate. So your training certificate, um, they will say, for this model, it is issued 7 February. Do you see? They already said that I've issued, that, that, I, that I received my, 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 my certificate. They remember this. All right. So let's go into module one. First part, historical overview. So now I'm just going to go in a little bit more depth. You can follow on the screen. You can fast read if you are, uh, if you can do audio and you can do reading. Um, I struggle a little bit with that. I can only listen or read, but um, you can choose. If you don't want to hear me, you can switch off and go on your own as well. Otherwise, I'm just going to quickly elaborate on some important aspects again before we go into the questions. So, part one, explain why research um, is important. We've, we've done this. Although there's a lot of new knowledge, there remain gaps. So, research are important. I don't think any of us have a question about that. Then the evolution of research ethics, as we have um, explained. Uh, let me just go down. Um, I just want to see something here quickly. Part 1 is 1.2, 1.1. The research question, the question is um, at the end. Question 1 is following 1.2. Okay, so it's following after the evolution of research ethics. So we have already discussed the questionable, questionable research practice, practices that gave way then from World War II to the Nuremberg Code in 1946 because of the inmate treatment of some humans there. As you have known, it's very well known. So it gave way to the Code of Nuremberg. But because of the the atrocities that happened in the very late um, 20th century, and we have discussed now the Tuskegee syphilis study. There's also other ones that I that I um, just continue. There's o there's also other ones that I are talking about here. The evolution of research ethics. Let me just go down. Then you're on the same page as I am. Here's the Nuremberg Code. Um, no, that is one too many. Let me just go back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just want to get my feel around here. Okay, so the Nuremberg Code um, was then um, brought about 
So let's jump into our first question, just to give us a feel of what's going on here. So question one, the Nuremberg Code published in 1947 emphasized the importance and absolute need for, there's four options, research involving humans even without their consent or knowledge, the rights of researchers in research involving humans, informed consent from research participants, or all of the above. So the question here, I see I have a bad network quality. I hope you can hear me. The question here then is, what exactly did the Nuremberg Code wish to do? What, what was the emphasis, emphasis of the Nuremberg Code, Code and the importance? Um, so you can choose any of those ones, any of those three or all of the above. It's your choice. If you have chosen one and you've moved on and it is wrong, just go back and do it again. If you uh, did uh, tick one, you can submit. Yeah, Tanya, we're getting um, some, we're starting to get some positive feedback. Uh, okay. Some have already concluded that and they receive certificate. There's one who's asking if they can do 3.2 or they are supposed to pay for that one. <laughs> no, no, this is a, a totally free course. All okay. of the models are free so they can continue doing all of them. It's wonderful that I worked ahead and do it so I'm very happy. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we're jumping into the evolu evolution of research ethics, the emergence. So on your screen and also in your resource documents, if you have it open, if you printed it out, they are illustrating then the questionable research practices uh, that we already talked about, the Brooklyn Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital, um, that we're using elderly patients, they're talking about the Willowbrook of the administration, of the hepatitis um, um, virus and then uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study we have talked about it in length and uh, that were done in a vulnerable community so this guy way then to the Belmont report and uh, I just want to see the question sorry I did model one a few a few weeks back so i'm just okay yeah, we are jumping into the next question so after the question will just remember what i've uh, indicated before after the question will research practices that gave way to the 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 the, the uh, belmont report um it was it was it was a very important uh, publication it was basically going all about the three principles respect for persons, uh, respecting autonomy and protecting people with diminished autonomy. It's all about beneficence, which is then the minimizing harms of maximizing of benefits. And then in this case, it was, it's about justice, but the justice was relating to the distribution of benefits and burdens. So I have not now talked a lot about the Parliament report. I wanted to do it now in the course. So, but let's do the question. There was a significant shift in the 20th century with respect to who bears responsibility for assessing the ethical acceptability of research protocols involving humans. Which statement best summarized this shift? There's four options. Let me just read it again. There was a significant shift in the 20th century with respect to who bears responsibility for assessing the ethical acceptability of research protocols involving humans. Which statement best summarized this shift? 
Researchers must negotiate the approval of their research protocols with the research institution they belong to. Researchers must now obtain the ethics approval of a peer review um, committee, such as those founded in grant agencies. An independent institutional committee will, with broad representation has a role to play in evaluating the acceptability of the protocol, or researchers must submit their protocols to public hearings. You can choose one of them. Okay, so moving on to 1.2.2 uh, called uh, still part one, the emergence of the formal uh, requirements of ethics e um, evaluation. Here I can now talk to you about the Belmont report. So the Belmont report has this three principles, this pillars it's standing on. The respectful persons, which then also we say respectful persons and dignity refers to autonomy. So just maybe to explain it a little bit. So in the um, if you if you have autonomy, you practice your free right to make a choice. That's to have autonomy. And then beneficence you requires beneficence. If you look at the principle of beneficence, it requires you to minimize harm and maximize benefits. And then justice then is all about the fairness and in the distribution of these benefits and the burdens of the research. So the three principles that I link to this is consent, which flows from the principle of respect for autonomy. Then they also look at risks at the risk potential benefit ratio, which flows from the principle principle of benefits. So for, in, for example, if you have a study um, and the risk outweighs the benefit, it will not get approved. Um, I'm a member of SOMAREC. SOMAREC is uh, doing private uh, organizations doing trials, um, research clinical trials. So we have a checklist and it's not all about checklist, but in this case, it's, it's very important to complete a review on a checklist form. So there's a specific um, section in this in this review form, which says, which states, if you, what is all the risks and what is the benefits? And then there's a question, does the risk, does the benefit outweigh the risk? If you say yes, you can continue. If you say no, we have to go back to the principal investigator. This is a very important risk potential benefit ratio that is not only applicable to biomedical uh, ethics. It's applicable to research. This is with human participants. Human participants is the most important factor in research ethics. That's why they are research ethics. Research ethics is all about the human participant. And then obviously also the wider living creature. That's why it's called bioethics. Uh, bioethics is all about living organisms, the environment, animals, use of creatures, use of people, humans. So then there's the equitable selection of research participants, which flows from the principle of justice. So the Belmont report is all about this. We have already talked about the ICHI, so I'm just going to continue and jump into the question, which is following this. Okay, listen quickly to the question. So the Malmont Report was published in 1979 and is one of the most influential documents for research involving humans. The Malmont Report identified three basic principles of ethics that are generally accepted, respect for persons, beneficence and justice. Which statement best describes the weight of the three principles of the Belmont Report today? The Belmont Report has primarily, has primarily historical value. It is too old to have any value for research conduct today, which is much different from research conduct 30 years ago. Uh, Tony, can you, Tony, can you still hear me? I see there's a bad network quality. Is it, is it fine? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay, no problem. This is the first question, the Belmont Report is too old. The second one, the basic principles of the Belmont Report provide general guides that leave uh, considerable room for determining what approach or action is the most ethical appropriate in a given situation. And then question three, 
Belmont report provides the only rules in form consent, risk benefit, and selection of subjects of research that anyone conducting the research needs to follow. So there are three choices for this question. So the question is, which statement best describes the weight of the three principles of the Belmont report as we have it today? Okay, did you have it correct? I hope so. So we're jumping to the last part of the part one, the last section of part one, why research ethics is important. Uh, we have talked about this. Um, it is important uh, because we are protecting the human, the human participants in research. So here is a question, question four, it's applicable to um, all the information that we have um, already talked about now as part of part one. Question four is all about the, uh, um, a case study, but you can just listen. Investigators in North America and Sub-Saharan Africa are working together to design a study protocol to test the efficacy of a vaccine for malaria. This study will take place in the African country. Why might it be important for a member of the community in which the study will take place to be part of the process of ethics review for the protocol? So just in short, um, these investigators, they are from North America and Sub-Saharan Africa, so they are working together as so a collaboration. They will um, look at the efficacy of a vaccine for malaria. It's a very important study. Just by knowing, we know that there's a lot of people still dying to die because of malaria. The study will take place in an African country. The question is, why might it be important for a member of the community in which a study will take place to be part of the process of ethics review for the protocol? There's three options. As a member of the study population, the community representative will be able to offer insights into the values and concerns of the community. Option two, as a member of the study population, the community representative will be able to communicate the risks and the benefits of the projects to other members of the community. And then you can also say both of the uh, both of the above. We know it is all of the above, but I mean there's just two, so any of the two, any of the, the three, or you can choose number three. This is a very important question. Um, if you go to page six of your resource document, um, I'm skipping a lot of work that we're doing normally in the course because I should actually have uh, a little bit labored it before we jump to the question. But with regards to um, also why research ethics um, is important. Um, if you go to the bottom there, the research involving humans is necessary for the involve, involve advancement of human health worldwide. But just this is not just human health, okay? It's let's just uh, just keep it like that now. But research ethics and to promote high standards of behavior in the conduct of research involving humans through an awareness of relevant values, principles, and rules. So this stay through. This stay through, irrespective of any kind of research that you are doing. So on the bottom of page six, it was it was saying, in the context of international collaborative research, there are often inequalities in resources between developed countries. 
which often sponsor research. So the developing country hosts the research. So it raises important ethical concerns and also the potential for exploitation. So also in some of the journal articles that you will come across in your studies, you will learn about exploitation a lot. Um, in the former part of, of 2000, maybe the latter part of the 1900s, but maybe in the, the first 10 years in 2000, there was a lot of studies going on as well in Africa. And sometimes they will call it helicopter research because you will only see the people that will come in with the helicopter land, leave, and people will be selected to be human participants and we will get to this again. Um, and then they will not really form part of any of the benefits of the research. In this case, malaria is definitely uh, a concern of the country involved. Okay, that's enough talking. So we are going now to part two, which is um, the core values and concepts of ethics res um, research involving humans. So you will remember that on that slide, I said we will delve into more uh, detail when I get to this point. Um, so part two is all about those principles that we have listed there. I just want to go down. There are seven of them. Uh, we will deal with question five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, and eleven. So this part of the module forms the gist of the module. So just to take you back, this is now on, on page seven of the resources document. This is the core values and concepts of ethics. So we have listed them on the screen, as I've shown you, they also give a summary here, but just let us jump into the first one. So the first one is justifying the inclusion of humans in research. What is the social value and scientific validity? So the social value, what they are talking about, research is, is not a right. Research is, is indeed actually a privilege. So normally taxpayers' money and grants are also uh, feeding into big research pro products, projects. So in light of the principle of the respect for persons, the justifications for including, including in the, in the individuals in a research project depend on the social value of the proposed research. This is a very important part of, of your research studies. You will learn this in research methodology that when you start up to choose a research topic, the other day I had a question where somebody was asking, um, when is it important to include research ethics in your research proposal? It is important to include it from the very start. It must be an intrinsic build in. Because when you choose your topic, you look at the social value of your research. You are looking at a problem, and the problem should actually come from your community, from your workplace. So you have to observe problems where you are, and then you have to do research to improve. This is what research is all about. So research must have a value. So you hypothesis your questions. Everything must be aligned. I always try to explain to the students when I grasp that it, it makes the most sense. And it is something that still up to today, when I review proposals, this is what I go for. Does the research question and the objectives align with what you're going to do? And if, if all of that aligns, that will then feed into understanding your research. So always, always give more information to your to your supervisor. Give more information. Tell what you mean. Explain what you mean in words. And in on this topic, um, I want to, to, to suggest that you give it to a peer review, to a peer, one of your peers, what your a friend, a, a student, maybe somebody that you trust, an academic. Ask them to read your proposal. It's very important. Uh, because they can see the gaps that you didn't identify. So social value is very important. The project must have value for a community. There must be some kind of reason why you're conducting research. It's also important that when you conduct research, for example, on a new drug, 
that it must be affordable for community that bears the burden of the research. So here is where exploitation is coming out. Then scientific validity or rigor. This is very important. Bad science is bad ethics. So there's always a big debate. Should we send back a research proposal based on research uh, science? But if your committee, we have committees at UNISA in the colleges that are working, that's a higher degrees committee, they are looking at the science of research proposals. So if the committee is, is working and they are doing uh, good work, they won't be a problem. But if you have a, a project and you do not align your objectives, if you look at your research, um, your informed consent form, and the questions that are, that are asked there for the human participant is not aligned with your objectives. How can you expect then the review to be favorable? You can't. It is important that it must be aligned. So the social rigor, uh, the, the scientific validity of your research are very important. So it, it, it's important to align it with your qualitative process, with mixed methods, with quanti, quantity, uh, quantitative uh, analysis. Sometimes we have a mixed method. All the more we use mixed methods, you do qualitative research, but you also present it with your questionnaire in a in a more um, quantitative format. So this is very important. You can read all about it later. We can jump into the question if you didn't read it again. Uh, we have a question on this part. Question five, assessing social value. Which one, which one of the following statements about social value is false? Social value or merit requires that research consists of a significant hypothesis or question that when addressed will have potential value or work. This value may accrue to individuals to advancing knowledge within a discipline, to society generally in relation to an important topic or issue or to some combination of these benefits. Sure, it is a mouthful. You can read it now on your own. Let me just see the second one. Remember that they are asking which of the statements is false. The second option, the social value of a protocol can be determined by a central scientific committee as this assessment is primarily a scientific question. Number four, non-scientific members of ethics committees have an important role in assessing the value of research. Then number four, sorry, this is number four. The value of research conduct by students most often lies in the fact that, that they are being trained as researchers. So just, just determine which of, the, which of the statements is false. So principle two is all about um, bringing about more good and all. Yeah, you, sorry to, yes. to disturb. Uh, for those, okay, there were questions about going back, but I asked them that they can do the continue, it will take them back. And those who didn't uh, get the 70%, uh, what will happen to them? They can redo it. Okay. They, they should, they, it should, they should be allowed to redo it immediately. So okay. they can even redo it now. Uh, Molebuche is asking again, how do I go back? You can click on continue, then yeah, it let, will take. Let me show him. Okay. Let me show um, him. I'm going to share him quickly live. Thank you. Um, so, so, for example, let me go back to. Um, let me go back to question. Which one now? Question four. All right, so question five were. Uh, one of the, which one of the following statements uh, about social value is false. So um, I'm just going to click um, this one. OK, so it says here yeah, it's, it's quite important. You can also read what it says because it's informative. So it says no, um, I'm not correct. The value of research conduct by students most often lies in the fact that they are being trained. Um, this is a true statement and so on and so on. So then I say continue. And when I say continue, because now I have to choose the right one, it takes me right back to the question again. 
You can even go about it two to three times. It will go back. Don't worry about it. You can just continue until you get it correct. Obviously, now it does diminish the, the chances of you getting 70%, unfortunately, uh, because it's first try. But you can continue, just remember, and then just come back and do it again. It's only 15 questions. It doesn't take that long. All right, so um, bring about more good and harm. Let's jump into 2.2. So here it is all about um, the, 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 the beneficent statement or do no harm. So in medical um, practice, uh, clinical in clinical practice, medical doctors do a code which they um, the hypocrisy hypocrisy code. That's an oath they take, and part of this oath is do no harm. And 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 sometimes uh, when we developed um, practices like euthanasia and passive um, passive uh, um, PAS passive assisted suicide, then um, people like doctors will have a problem because of this oath. It's very difficult. Even if even if you can you can you can guide them with arguing arguments why this will be the best for the patient and the qualitative qualitative life of the patient is not what it should be and it's the patient's uh, will. It's still very difficult because of this hope. So this is embedded in in in, in this is definitely a, a due diligence medical do no harm. So any harm caused by research should be outweighed by the good. So you have to optimize the potential benefits of the research. For example, the health, the safety, the knowledge and the satisfaction, you have to minimize the risk. So researchers have to take these principles into, a, into account when designing their project, projects in order to ensure that all risks have been minimized to the greatest extent possible and that remaining risks are justified in the context of the question being studied. So research ethics uh, committees then give attention to the well-being of research participants. So when you want to study uh, a certain social stigma or something that could harm uh, the participant, not necessarily hurts the the person, you know, it can harm the person socially by being by association. This is a very important uh, principle to understand that you can do a lot of harm to a person by association. So um, we are by association classified. Unfortunately, unfair maybe, but that is how society um, role, you can say. And then um, here you have to be very, very careful. Specifically also when you have a race or gender in your, uh, in your um, research protocol, uh, we're going to have a Papilla Day in November. And uh, it's, Papilla is the law that's now that you can't just you know, ask anything about anybody or share information or personal information or use it. So for PR is a very important um, act that we will have to give attention to as researchers. But one of the things that's important is you use race or gender. If you can justify it with a good justification, then you can do it. But it must outweigh then the risk of the study. Also very important, Sometimes we don't know as research ethics committees, what will be the outcome of this research study? The researcher can give you a, a wonderful research proposal, but if you do not see the gaps, like the questions that do not align with the objectives of the study, you could miss a very important thing that after the results are in, can become a social uh, media, um, you know, uh, attraction for very, very great home to, to a community. So just continue then. I think there's a question. This is all about questions today. Question six. 
what constitutes a sound analysis of risk and potential benefits of a research project. So, I just want to see. I'm just going to read it to you. Evaluating the acceptability of risk and potential benefits of a research project is central to the work of research ethics committees. The REC will strive to ensure that potential participants will only be invited to participate in research that is not unreasonable. In practice, this involves conducting a risk benefit an, uh, analysis. So choose the definitions definition that correctly describe what is involved in a risk benefit analysis. So I think you'll be able to, to do this already. The first one, so you have to choose the definition that best describes the risk benefit analysis. So um, option one, when conducting the risk, risk benefit analysis, the REC will verify that participants will not be exposed to any risk during their participation in research. Option two, when conducting the risk benefit analysis, the REC will verify that potential benefits to others are significant since this justifies that participants may be exposed to any level of risk. Option 3. When conducting the risk benefit analysis, the REC will verify that potential benefits to participants and to others be optimized and that the risk to participants and to others be minimized. And then option 4. When conducting the risk benefit analysis, only the risk and potential benefits to participants should be considered by the REC. This is a very, uh, it's a mouthful. You can just read it again and decide. Um, I hope that you are done with the question. This was question six. Moving to principle three. The interest of humans who participate in, in, in research must come before the interest of science and society. You will remember that we have discussed this already, that uh, the interest of uh, human beings is central and it must, you have to ensure autonomy, which is respect for human dignity. So when patients are entered into a study, no matter how important this study, if they are likely to suffer any acceptable or unreasonable level of harm, they should not be allowed. Jumping to question seven. This is a long paragraph. <clears throat> I'm going to read it. It's a study that I'll do, that I'm going to do. The use of quanacrine Hydrochloride as an alternative to surgical sterilization of women created ethical debate in the 1990s due to the conflicting evidence of its safety. Proponents of the drug once argued in favor of its efficacy, it is a, real, uh, a high efficacy I see, 98% um, in pregnancy and 99% in surgery. And safety, there was only two deaths per 100,000 women that was sterilized in the US with no deaths reported. So, um, however, some research show that a drug caused cells to mutate in vitro and some results show a cancer cluster in one region in South America where the drug has been tested. So women advocacy groups labeled the quanacrine studies as unethical experiments on poor women. I guess in this case they, uh, they are um, indicating ill-resourced women. A group of European researchers want to revive studies of quanacrine. So, so that there were studies. This is a real study. It's case 21. You can read about it. There's a lot of cases also at the back of the resource document. So this was already done and there were some results. So now a group of European researchers want to revive the studies. They argue that no association between quantum study studies and future increased risk of cancer could be ascertained on the basis of a study involved, involving a small American sample and that no increase in cancer incidence have been, has been recorded in the use of the drug for parasitic diseases. Even though quantum was never approved for sterilization, 
The scientists plan to implement programs to provide and study quinacrine for female sterilization on the grounds that denying women access to a safe, inexpensive and easily administered form of sterilization is unethical. The researchers are aware of the potential risk yet consider the potential benefits as significant. They would like to just be able to test quinacrine again on a group of women to reassess its safety profile. In their view, if they approach a country where maternity mortality is high and access to methods of contraception and safe surgical sterilization is poor, conducting a clinical trial for quinacrine would be acceptable despite the safety concerns because women in that country would have nothing to lose. Given what is known about the risk and benefits of quinacrine for sterilization, which of the following statements is true? So just to sum up, they say, they argue that the, the, the population they used in South America was just too small to really indicate that this, this, this is forming cancer and that it is not true and that the benefits are greatly because of the significant um, results that are already received from the efficacy and they really want to reassess the safety profile. And they are actually then also arguing that this is taking away from women because if this, if this option is uh, favorable, it could increase the safety of women. And incidentally, in sub-Saharan Africa, there is still mortality with, with uh, pregnancy. So that is very true. So even up to today, there's a huge maternity, there's a huge mortality index. So given what is known about the risk and benefits of quinacrine for sterilization, which of the following statements is true? So now you have to put your true fat on. So decide which of the following four options is true. Option one. The risk identified from results of a study conducted in South America are not relevant to the new study that is now being proposed in another part of the world. Or option two, the potential benefits for women in many areas of the world are so significant that I, just, that I justify exposing the small group of women who will participate to the trial to any level of risk. Option three, the level of potential benefits can justify exposing research participants to important risks as long as the risk to participants are minimized to, extent, to the extent possible. And then option four, if participants are fully informed and provide voluntary consent, the level of risk, the level of risks is not relevant. So you have to decide which of the following four statements is true. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to um, the fair distribution of risk and potential benefits. So, in the previous um, in the previous question, the number four of the of the principle there was voluntary participation. We are now with the fair distribution of risk and potential benefits of the, of the research. So we call it, in most cases, we call it the justice principle. So the justice referred to the fair distribution of risk and potential benefits. So typically researchers will respect justice by ensuring that those who share in the burdens of the research also share in its potential benefit. We have spoken about this before. There's just um, in the middle of the of the page, on page 12, they say, the systematic exclusion of groups of individuals can also result in unfair distribution of benefits. A, gro a group may might be excluded or suffer adverse events due to the lack of specific research of their shared characteristics, such as age, environment or nutrition. Exclusion of an effective group from a single research study might not on its own be problematic, but the exclusion of an effective group from an entire field or program is certainly problematic. So this was a gap that was identified um, at the World um, Health Organization and it was also listed in the operational guidelines for ethics committees. So 
they argue that the majority of our medical research is motivated for the benefit of already privileged communities. But 90% of the resources devoted to research is actually applied to diseases causing less than 10% of the present global suffering. They call it a 90 slash 10 gap. So the establishment of the international guidelines that assist in strengthening the capacity for the ethical review of biomedical research in all countries contributes to the re um, redressing of this imbalance. This is a very important um, argument that I, um, that I argue here. That exclusion of certain groups uh, may not lead to the benefit of those groups, but also then that the majority of uh, companies paying for research are then also then um, concentrating on the on the on the burden of 10 percent of the world where the other diseases are much more but they don't get the necessary attention so question nine then The need to justify inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is another um, clinical trial question. Researchers designing in a, a clinical trial have decided to exclude persons with mental disabilities given the potential risks associated with the study drug and the concerns of other investigators that the complexity of the protocol will present too many difficulties to these subjects to ensure safe compliance. You are the chairperson of the local REC the principal investigator consults you to ask persons with uh, to ask if persons with mental disabilities can be excluded. What is the best answer you can provide? There's three answers. One, this is not an easy judgment call, and it's important that a choice of study population or who will be included be justified in the protocol. Question two: Persons with mental disabilities should not be included in research because they cannot provide consent themselves. And number three, ensuring the safety of research participants is critical and in this case justifies not allowing persons with disabilities to participate. Just think carefully about this one. Um, they are designing a clinical trial that is very comple complex, but I want to exclude persons with mental disabilities because there is a potential risk of the study drug. It will, it will indicate too much difficulties to ensure the safety compliance. So if you are a REC chair, what is the best answer that you can provide if the principal investigator consults you to ask if they can be excluded? So this was question nine, um, which is the principle five. Principle six is all about showing ongoing respects for persons. This is then also one of the points in uh, informed consent form, um, which is part of the informed consent guidelines. Does the study uh, provides ongoing respect for participants? It's a very important point. Um, especially with regards to clinical trials, you can just imagine if you are in normally clinical trials, um, the best way to test a new product is to have a randomized control clinical trial. So it will involve two arms and then even it will involve a placebo. So it will have a placebo and a new drug. And if there is a drug that um, is in the market, they should use that drug. But if it is a new drug, so for example, the, the one control arm will be the one group and the other one will be uh, the, the, the old drug or the placebo, and it will be a double blind peer review. So nobody will know except the data safety monitoring board if they have to open it and there's an um, there's a adverse event. Somebody um, um, develop a, 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 a storm, they call it a cyclic storm in their body, switches off the organs or a, a very severe advent, even death can occur. So then I will open the, the, um, 
the envelope and I will see the on, on what on which arm was this this participant. So clinical trials are very interesting and uh, and they are also um, they are also they also proceed with very um, you know with with caution caution. I think I've skipped to the question. Does, does this go on to the question? Okay, this is exclusion. Sorry guys, let me just find my way again back. Okay, sorry, I jumped to the question. So, um, so they, they explained in on page 13, just see if I'm on the right page now. I always get this part on 2.6. You can just imagine now, if after two years, maybe being on a trial, they have discovered that uh, the drug is um, highly uh, has a high efficacy, and this uh, the results are significant, and they stopped using it, or there was an adverse event, and people are really there was more than one event, then you have to be you have to be informed as a clinical. Uh, trial participant. So demonstrated ongoing respect in trials is very important. And uh, there's two points there that you can read. If, they, if there was a procedural arm, will the particip participants of the control arm receive the experimental, experimental drug if it's proven to be efficacious, efficacious? This is also an important question. And this has to be sorted out in the beginning of the trial. So for example, you enroll participants that are maybe uh, suffering from cancer and this is a cancer related trial will they then have access to the to the drug when 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 after the trial if it shown to be effic efficacious and will participants then in the trial continue to receive the tested product if the trial is complete so there's a lot of questions sometimes arising from this in developing countries consideration should also be given to the wider community if they will have benefits from the research. It's a very um, huge contentious issue and it's really not very straight answers with regards to this. If you want to read more on this, you can also consult um, the references that I also give it on each page. So question 10 then relates to um, another case study, another question. Also biomedical, I'm very sorry. Um, they do think to have much more of this, but in model 2.1 and 3.1, as I've said earlier, this is not the case. So we are now, it's 10.30. We are 30 minutes away from being done. We are already at question 10. So let's just uh, move along. So question 10, meeting the health needs of the study population. A team of genetic researchers has decided to conduct a study to try to identify genes involved in heart disease. They approached the community from another country because of its high rate of heart disease and significant isolation from other com uh, com com communities. After obtaining the necessary approvals from the local research ethics committee, as well as from the government authorities, the team of researchers proceeded to collect blood samples from participants who provided consent. The participation rate was excellent given the heavy burden of disease in the community and the shared desire to advance research in this field. When the DNA sample collection process was completed, the researchers returned to their home institution to start the sequencing and analysis. Genet um, geneticists and clinicians from the community that had donated their blood samples believed that some of the research, the research results and information generated would be important to the continuing management of patients who suffered from a particular lethal cardiomyopathy. They contacted the research team and asked for research results to be communicated back to them for the direct benef benefit of patients. Access to any information or research result was then refused and the DNA samples were inaccessible because they were stored in the researcher's country. When the clinicians informed their patients that they had been denied access to the research results, 
Many felt that I had been wronged by the research team. This feeling was made worse when I found out that the DNA samples has been moved to another country. Should this situation be a concern for local authorities like RECs or research institutions or the government who approved the research? So just to sum up, they have worked with a community with a very high prevalence of heart disease. They did collect blood. They took the blood to another country. And then when researchers in the country was inquiring about this, they were denied access to the DNA samples also because it was in another country and even the results. The question is, should this situation be a concern for local authorities? Answers no, because the research participants did not suffer any direct harms from the situation. In fact, samples were obtained following due approval from a REC and following participant consent. And yes, uh, it should be a concern because access to research results could provide benefits to patient participants. This is a very interesting question. Not too difficult, just think carefully. I hope you have it all correct. Then the last principle, we're almost done, is then upholding transparency during the research process. Um, so transparency is just that when there's conflicts, it should be declared. There could be many um, interest in a research study. You can just think if there's a grant or there could be scientific interest, corporate interest from businesses, personal interest. So some of these interests may compete with and even hinder research participants' interest and well-being. So some conflicts are very common among sponsors hosting researchers. And uh, they also then allude here on page 14 that the interest of research subjects should take priority over the types of interest that they are. So on, if you want to ensure transparency in health research, for example, it is the requirement for registration of clinical trials. And then, like I've also indicated, there is, a, there is also a, a, a database. Just interesting, I'm not sure what you answered, but in the previous question, um, think about it. It's it's now very um, it's very bad that I cannot speak to you and get your answers because I would, would like to ask you what do you think um, transparency in the informed consent of these researchers, in my opinion, should have indicated that the blood samples will be going to the to another country and it will not be again be available. So um, it is very important to declare information like this. This is, this is very important, even more important. If you do ask participants to, um, uh, to, 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 to get blood samples or tissue or anything like that, we have a whole act in South Africa dealing with tissue, tissue samples. Don't have the act number now with me, but it is part of our research ethics principles is also included in the Department of Health's guidelines. It's very important. There's a whole set of rules accompanying things like organ, tissues, blood. What are they doing with it? It's restrictive. Patients, uh, in this case, research participants, have a very quick say in what is happening uh, with their, their, their blood samples, for example. And genetic studies, this is much more important. And you're going to learn more about it in module uh, 2.1 and also 3.1. In 3.1, uh, which is the informed consent, I will go into the different criteria that's needed for studies like this, how you can do research uh, responsibly. So question 11 is all about upholding transparency. It's luckily a short question. 
Upholding transparency during the research process is important because it helps ensure that the interest and well-being of participants are not hindered by other competing interests. Which of the following statements describe how best to maintain transparency? You can choose one of them or you can choose all of them. Option one, declaring to the REC any relationship that you as an investigator or your spouse may have with the sponsor of the trial. Option two, refusing a contract as a consultant to the sponsor while acting as an investigator for a trial funded by the same sponsor. Or number three, adding a statement in the consent documents to inform participants that a trial is funded by a private pharmaceutical company. Or you can then also choose that all three is upholding them or maintaining transparency. Remember the principle that any interest or any competing interest doesn't take precedent over the, um, the interest of the research participant. Okay, now it brings us to the end of part two, bringing us to part three. We have uh, only a few questions left. So we are done with the bulk of the module which was the principles. So part three is the overview of the normative framework applicable to health research involving humans. There's only a few things that I just want to quickly brush over before we jump to the question. You, we have already dealt with the Medical Association, uh, the Declaration of Helsinki, which was now seen in 2013 on the seventh revision. Um, it is a very important declaration. Um, I would urge you to read it. If you're interested in research ethics, this would be one of the, the Belmont report, the Declaration of Helsinki is one of the guideline documents that I would urge you to read. And then, then the World Health Organization um, also, and still, is creating very good documents. And they have overviews and committees, and they are working very hard to, um, to, to, to look at the health of the world. Then the Council for uh, International Organizations of uh, Medical Sciences, that's the long name for SEOMS. SEOMS is a medical science one. It's an international non-governmental non-profit organization. It was established, established jointly by the WHO and UNESCO in 1949. Uh, in my opinion, when I started off studying uh, research ethics in 2010, it was one of the best documents that I've read concerning human subjects, human participants. Um, so SEOMS is a very good guideline document. You can make use of this document. Um, if it uh, struck a chord in your, in your research problem, you can, you can refer to this document as well um, in your research proposal. And then you have already, we have already alluded on the International Conference on Harmonization, the ICHGCP. This is, um, a very important um, document to always allude to if you have a clinical trial. But then there is, there are also other instruments. Um, uh, we have discussed the declaration, um, the UNESCO declaration on bioethics and human rights. Um, for global ethics, this is a very important document. Very important document. You can also you can also drive it down to more national, but it gives you a very broad framework of human rights and protections in, um, in, 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 in research. So then we have also national instruments. Um, I cannot, I will maybe include uh, uh, the, the, not will, I will definitely include the Department of Health 2050 guidelines for you. So Tony can send it out to you. That will, uh, if you don't have yet a copy, this is a very good document to refer to. Then these broader guidelines, I just want to uh, lay, uh, just uh, inform you quickly. Broader, broader regulation, regulations. It's all about the next question. That's why I want to come to here to this point. In many countries, 
uh, there are no specific uh, maybe research ethics committees or regulatory bodies or guidelines. However, this does not mean that they are operating in a legal vacuum. So broader based legal frameworks will also provide guidance and minimal standards that must be met. For example, in many countries with a civil code or a constitution, there will be a broader provision protecting individuals' physical integrity as well as requiring respect for autonomy. So, um, if you do a study in another country and they do not have um, accredited REC or a regulatory body with regards to research, this does not exclude uh, your participants uh, to enroll in any kind of research because especially with regards to criminal law there is in any country a constitution however this you have to identify this so when researchers researchers are also healthcare professionals uh, you also have to respect professional codes like i've already included in the, the beginning of the module um, the code that i take the oath um, you you cannot go you cannot get away as a professional. Uh, you will also be always will be accountable for your codes. So question twelve thing, true or false? In countries where there are no national rules, for example legislation or guidelines that apply specifically to research involving humans, researchers can conduct any kind of research as they wish as long as they obtain consent from participants. You have two options, true or false. Then institutional requirements. Um, Institutional requirements is, uh, for example, research institutions and universities that have an ethical conduct of research involving humans. Um, everybody has some sort of policy, like at UNISA we have a policy on research ethics, we have a policy on research uh, on academic integrity. Do you know those policies? If you don't know them, it's a good place to get hold of them. You can ask Tony, he has uh, resource documents available. Um, we have specific forms, so if you have research, we have four different forms. So we have form one, if you want to use uh, participants and human participants in your research, you need to complete form one. The College of, um, the College of Education and um, CHS, they have different forms, but it doesn't matter what it's called, they all all about um, the, the the risk and the, the risk um, evaluation. So there are different forms. This form two, which is when you do secondary, uh, when you use secondary data. Form three is when you do, for example, desktop uh, related uh, research, not human participants. And then form three is when you uh, have an amendment on your research. You have to fill in that one. So in COVID-19, as we are experiencing at the moment with our strict um, regulations and uh, um, access to participants and non-access to homes, uh, nursing homes and so on, you have to fill in form four if you want to change your research methodology, your research, um, your, your, your um, informed consent or your, 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 your methods, you have to fill that in. Okay, so everybody has requirements then with regards to research. Okay, so this question then, jumping in here, um, question 13. So this is relating to institutional guidelines and national guidelines, broader consent, all of those. It's also a case study. Um, it's a second last question, this just asked. It's also adopted from a, from a WHO case study. It's ethics review for developing a malaria vaccine again. Um, in an earlier case study in this model, investigators in North America and Sub-Saharan Saharan Africa worked together to design a study protocol to test the efficacy of a multi-stage DNA vaccine for malaria. 
there has not yet been any provision made for ethics review in the country where the research will be conducted. The North American partner suggests that this might not be necessary because the IRB in America they call uh, they are called in some cases in Europe as well the ethics review committees they call it institutional review boards so the IRB and the REC is the same thing so they suggest that the IRB review that took place in the United States apply the Belmont principles and is therefore adequate you are the chairperson of the REC at the hospital which has been contacted to become a research site your REC was set up only recently and has not yet dealt with any international collaborative clinical trials. You have concerns, however, because your hospital has been chosen to adhere to the Declaration of Helsinki and the SEOMS guidelines. You have identified three possible options for the review of the study protocol. Choose the best answer. So this, this poor chairperson of the REC, a very, very new REC in a hospital, um, has now decided, has now to make a decision if uh, the hospital can become a research site. So, given the justification from the risk the investigation, the investigators, what did I say? I said, no, don't worry about this because the IRB that initially approved the study, which uh, uh, which are taking different sites, they apply the Belmont principles. It is a, a recognized and accredited IRB board. So you don't have to worry. This is fine. So you then have to decide. You have three options. You use the ethics review and approval that was provided by the IRB in the United States. Secondly, you conduct a second review to ensure that local consideration have been taken into account. And then number three, you conduct your own review as if no other review has been conducted. You can choose one of those as, an, uh, as your answer. Okay, so let's just now move on. We're almost done. This was the last question then with regards to the overview of the normative frameworks applicable to health research, including humans. Then part four is just an introduction to research ethics evaluation. If you do uh, module 2.1, um, this will give you a much broader framework. So 4.1 is what is research ethics? I think we have dealt with this. Ethics, um, what is research ethics evaluation? It's when we, there's a deliberate ethical, de when there is an ethical debate and decision making. Um, it is always at one time if the REC can gather and have different opinions around the table. Because, because RECs are constituted of different um, role, role models. For example, uh, if you do health research, there must be clinicians. Um, you have to have the representation of the legal framework of the community, of lay people, lay, lay members are normally people that's not a professional in the field, but is from the community. Um, so. Regs are made up of different people. They have to decide and deliberate and they have to review and then they have to reach a consensus. consensus. Why is it important? We know why it is important due to the escalation of uh, the atrocities and um, unfair practices that research that has come about. Uh, the research ethics review was important and it was regulated. It was then um, uh, there was a certain uh, normative frameworks that we have just dealt with that had to come into being. So um, research ethics evaluation is important because uh, it ensures that a project is ethically acceptable and then also protects the human participant. But I think you know all about that. So let's jump into our second last question. The legitimacy of decisions of a research ethics committee. Ideally, 
direct deliberates and eventually comes to a consensus um, of a collective opinion about how to resolve ethical problems that all members find ethically satisfactory. So to have a few statements here, they ask which one is false. Consensus reached by the REC has moral weight because it emerges out of deliberations that are honest, factually well-informed and rule-governed and fair. Then, uh, option two, consensus reached by the REC has moral weight when there are no widely recognized independent grounds for establish establishing the moral truth. Option four, uh, the three, consensus are reached by the REC when um, consensus that is reached for the REC has moral weight when there are no single authoritative deci decision makers available. And then consensus reached for the REC has moral weight only for projects that raise no ethical issues and controversies. This one should be fairly easy for you to mark as false, which one it is. So you have to decide uh, that consensus reads by the REC as moral weight when there's deliberations that are honest, factually well informed and rule and fair, or there's no way to recognize groups for establishing moral truth, or it, there's no single authoritative decision makers, or um, the project that right it's only for projects that raise no ethical issues or controversies. Brings us to the second last point, the role and mandate of the Research Ethics Committee. Um, the Research Ethics Committee deliberates because they are um, primarily concerned for the well-being, safety and protection of research participants. So the REC ensure the protection of research participants by ethics evaluation and approval, continuing review of ongoing research, the active promotion of principles of ethics. I think it's clearly, um, I think it's clearly um, safe to say that you understand the role of the REC. Then the authority of REGs, generally REGs um, can, can uh, come to a decision if it is acceptable as presented a research proposal. It needs to be modified um, as per REG comments. It requires more information to make a decision or it is unacceptable in its current form. So it's more or less the four um, decisions that a REG can reach. So then the question here is the authority of REX. Is, 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 is the decision that REX make, is it binding or is it advisory? So the decisions of REX is binding um, only if they say the indicate here on page 90. It's binding if a positive REC decision is required and a negative decision cannot be overridden by regulatory or institutional authorities. REC decisions will be advisory if, the, if it can be overturned by higher authorities such as hospital administrators or Ministry of Health officials. Ideally, a regulatory or institutional authority would consider itself bound by a negative REC decision. A REC decision. Uh, just, just as a matter of explanation, um, in 2010-2011, the, in um, non-therapeutic research on children were not allowed if the Minister of Health didn't approve it in South Africa. So the NH REC then um, has taken over this uh, kind of decision making by allowing, uh, or not allowing, um, as being the regulatory body that accredited REGs in South Africa. So if you are a member of a REG or if you want to submit your research proposal to a REG, you have to make sure that that REG is actually an accredited body of the NIH REC because then it has authority. The other important thing to remember is that REC has uh, independency. A REC is independent. It, it's, it's one of the, 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 the cornerstones of being part of a REC, making decisions with regard to ethical matters. 
If you are independent, your decisions is binding. It depends on how your um, accreditation was stipulated. So, um, for example, now uh, there's very strong uh, regulations with regards to um, non-therapeutic research on children, but it can be um, it can be reviewed by a, a accredited rec of the NIH rec. So. The last paragraph is quite important. Um, whether the REC decision is binding or, the, or advisory depends on the applicable regulation and if there is a requirement for ethics approval. Requirements for ethics approval may not necessarily exist in the country hosting the research. A requirement may exist in the country sponsoring the research or in the country where the clinical trial data will be submitted in support of a submission for market approval of an experimental drug. So the moment you are entering into international collaborative research, there's a lot of in information that comes into play. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is bringing us to the last question of the three module one. I hope you are happy. Now you can all just finish and go and make some tea or coffee. So the last question, Question 15 of module one. A physician at your research institution has been asked to be an investigator for a large placebo controlled multi-center study for a new cancer drug. The study will involve 10 sites in three countries. The investigator submitted the protocol to your local REC. After careful deliberation, the REC determines that the use of a control arm or placebo is not justified because standard treatment for this type of cancer exists and is accessible. The REC concludes that the experimental drug should be compared to a standard treatment or used as an add-on to standard treatment. The investigator responds to the REC stating that he cannot modify the protocol because it is a pharmaceutically sponsored trial that is also being conducted at nine other sites. The REC then refused to permit the trial to proceed. So this is something that um, we have explained earlier, this is a, a multi-site multi, multi uh, randomized control uh, uh, clinical trial. So in this case, there is, uh, there is a standard treatment for this type of cancer. So if the experimental drug needs to be compared to a placebo, you can rather compare it to the standard drug or use it as an add-on. So a very valid is that they were, ask, they were asking for the other drug. So as the investigator, the investigator then decide to consult you and you are the chief executive officer of the research institute. You are asked to override a negative rec decision and to improve the conduct of the trial. Now the question is, is this request acceptable, yes or no? It links closely to another question that we had just earlier with regards to um, um, should, uh, should you perform your, as a hospital administrator, should you perform your own or not review or are you accepting another um, REX review? Very interesting question. Um, if I were you, I will pick all of them and just look at all the answers. Um, it's a quite good exercise and it's easy to copy and paste it. So sometimes when, for example, you give it the wrong answer, they will explain why they see it's wrong. They also explain further, three, that there is no right or wrong answers. So it's very important with regards to ethics review that you use frameworks, normative frameworks that's available, but in the research proposal review committee where, where the research proposal or the, uh, the form are being reviewed you use what is available to you you use the principle for uh, the frameworks you use 
whatever frameworks there are to inform you, but you use also the research proposal and the justification to inform you. So for research ethics committees, this is a very important point. That's why earlier I say, if you are a researcher, you are busy with your research proposal, use the, use the Department of Health guidelines and make research ethics intrinsically part of your research proposal. It's part of your proposal. If you use human participants, it's part of your proposal. You cannot develop something later. Um, sometimes your pilot study will um, inform how your questionnaire will look. That's different. That's different. Um, then you, you write it as such. Then you have a phase. You say, I have a population. I'm going to use 20 people. I'm going to test the questionnaire. The test then will show me but you also have to get permission to use that initial test. Then you, if you, you develop your questionnaire from the test and then you um, provide this to the, re, uh, the REC and then they review your second phase. So it's very possible to do this. So the REC won't forget. They will issue you um, your certificate to do your research on your pilot, but then they will wait for your questionnaire to do a full review again. Then they will look. Now, in fact, do your questionnaire really speak to your objectives? Is that anything change? So we cannot, for example, um, approve a study without the questionnaire. It will be referred back. So the instruments are very important. And how you also um, reach um, your decision to use those instruments, that are, that's also very important. You have to refer you have to requ request permission from from um, authors if you want to use an instrument, unless it is a, a public in the public domain. For example, an existing questionnaire, and people will say, for example, in the article, you can use this questionnaire without permission of the author. But if they develop the new kind of tool that you want to use, you have to ask permission to use it. Then you have to state it in the research proposal. This is the questionnaire I'm using because of X, Y, and Z, and also I've received permission. Okay, so we have reached the end. I just hope that everybody um, is on par. If now you didn't obtain 70%, it's not a problem. You can just go back to the beginning and start again. So now to go back, here yeah, I need Tandu always. I'm not always sure how to go back exactly the way I started. Um, so here is the beginning now. So if you have obtained your, your certificate and, and you um, um, you finalized and you received 70%, congratulations. I hope it wasn't too boring for you. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening to me.